means chaos. So I'm the troublemaker. Any problems you are having, you can blame it on me. But putting joking aside, I was born in Iran, came to America when I was 18, and uh, I went through school very quickly. I was 20 years old. I had a couple bachelor degrees. <laughs> when I was 22, I, I had my master's. No then I came and worked at Hewlett Packard in Palo Alto, HP. And then I had a crazy idea, started a hope, I hope, I hope the mic design on. automation uh, software company. <laughs> and uh, before I was uh, 30 years old, uh, Tektronix bought it for 75 million. Then after else, that, I the started Cirrus Logic, which was the first fabless semiconductor company, the father of yeah. all uh, fabless semiconductor How's companies. How's the, how's the main stage? In that company, Smaller. our revenue grew over a billion dollars and our market cap was over 3.5 billion. Neomagic was my fourth company that uh, went public at valuation of over 300 million. And uh, within a couple years, it was worth more than 700 million. But the biggest one that yeah, I had was Centillium Communications, the sixth company that uh, develop ADSL, and uh, it went public at valuation of 700 million, and within two years was worth over 4 billion. New York, what you know, New this York, does not Kiev, say is all my screw-ups yeah. and the You're problem companies that didn't make it. Of the 10 companies, six of them had good results, only one but three of them were failures, and uh, one of them, Momento, was a huge failure. Uh, I lost $40 million on that one and was fired by my board of directors. About 14 years ago, I moved to venture capital. This is a global venture capital fund. We have investments in US, Japan, China, India, and Israel. And now we are looking into investing in Russia and CIS countries also. A big part of my life has been the philanthropic side of it. I uh, was founder of Schools Online, that we set up uh, computer labs in 6,400 schools in 36 countries between 1996 and 2003 to help ignite the internet revolution all over the world. And also, I was uh, for two years uh, co-chair of United Nations GATE, Global Alliance for Use of ICT in Development. Just giving you as a background, I want to tell you how all of that relates to the topic of global innovation economy. As I mentioned, six dimensional matrix. The first dimension is information, technology, innovation value. The higher you go, the higher is the value. To make this kind of clear for you, let's pick up a task, a very simple task that all of us are familiar with. If you are looking at sewing, if you do it by hand, you might make a dollar a day or two dollars a day, very, very low level of productivity. Over the years, we invented mechanical sewing machine that allowed the productivity to go higher and a person could make more money. Then electromechanical one added a little electric motor next to it and made it be a lot better and faster. Then when microelectronics came, sewing machines started to have microprocessors in it with some floppy that would allow you to have some simple patterns already there so you didn't have to do it yourself. When we got to the age of software, you can have a sewing machine with a DVD and a lot more complicated patterns in it, and your productivity and the value of the product could go a lot higher. But today, you can buy a sewing machine with an iPad embedded in it with internet connectivity, and you can go and select pattern from anywhere in the world, and you can become Pierre Cardin or Cartier or uh, Versace or anybody that you like, and zeroing on the design. 
And if you have a popular, successful design, you can make millions of dollars. You can apply this IT innovation axis to any field. On photography, if you try to draw a picture of this room by hand, it takes quite a while. Versus if you use a mechanical camera, it is a little bit faster. Digital camera gives you much better things. Newest digital cameras with advanced microprocessors, lots of great software, allow you to do many changes on it immediately. But the highest value company is not the one that takes the camera. A company like Facebook or Instagram that takes the content and your pictures and moves those around effectively. So the internet plays a huge role because it plays at the level of software and at the level of content for the movement of the content. And we all have heard that internet is for everyone, anytime, anywhere. And of course, you are all familiar with the Google Glass and it looks quite hip till you go and try it on and it does not look that good. When my friends at Google saw this, they said, okay, we have to go back to redesign it because it looks, uh, I guess, good on the good looking people and makes ugly people look uglier. The newest buzz that you must have heard in the last couple of years is internet of everything. And when they say everything, it really means everything. With IPv6 and persistent addresses, IP addresses available there in trillions of numbers, you can have everything having an internet access that you could control it. To show you an extreme, this is a toilet which has internet connection. It has an iPhone interface. I actually, being a geek that is not yet reformed, I installed this in my house. I can have a profile of me versus profile of my wife. When I get close to it, it knows whether I have number one or number two and raises it up or down. Adjust the temperature according to my liking, plays my favorite music from my iTunes, and long distance you can adjust the kind of spray that it has uh, after you are done. Now, if you go up, you can create chaos and be disruptive. And really, a big part of entrepreneurship on IT is figuring out where you go up. However, you could also go horizontally Stronger at each one way. of these levels. If you do that, it's still innovation, but it's not disruptive. It would have incremental value. Here is an electromechanical incremental value of a golf cart. Bobo Smith uses this one. And it is a hovercraft converted to a golf cart, a 50s, 60s invention, but allows you to finish a round of golf in less than four, uh, two hours because it goes over the grass, over the water, over the sand, anything. But it's not a major innovation. Major innovation is when you figure out in what sector is the time to move from electromechanical to microelectronics, or from microelectronics to software, or from software to content. And it varies according to time. So second dimension is timing innovation value. Most of the time you hear the first mover advantage. That is very important. But also, if you are too early, it can be a huge problem. You remember I mentioned to you three of my companies failed and failed miserably. The biggest failure was Momento. It was iPad 20 years out of its time, ahead of its time. And when I had a crazy dream that I was reading Wall Street Journal in 1989, I went and in my dream, put my finger on an advertisement for Honda automotives cars 
and it delivered a color video to me. And I came back next day. We had just taken Cirrus Logic public. I went and I told my best engineers, let's get together. I've had this dream. We should go and make this thing. When we had no internet, no wireless connectivity, no chips that could do 3D graphics or even the slightest form of video. We didn't even have colored LCDs then. But I was so determined to do this, and we designed it so that it had no buttons. iPad and iPhone have one button. We designed the user interface of Momento to have no buttons. But when we showed it to everyone, we got about $300 million worth of orders from the biggest computer distributions, because everybody was saying, this is amazing. We were on the cover of 20 magazines. But when we started the shipment, in our first year, we sold less than $3 million. And you might think it's good for a startup, except I had promised my investors $100 million first year revenue. So it was April 1st, 1992. I came to work. I saw there is a board meeting. I said, I'm chairman, founder, CEO. I didn't call a board meeting. They said, we did. You are fired. And I thought it was April Fool's Day joke. Because April 1st, as you know, everybody does practical jokes. But nobody was joking. They really kicked me out. Another big screw up of mine was Kahoot's. We developed Skype five years ahead of Skype. But too early, it happened right around June 2000 after the crash of NASDAQ. We had about 20 million in the bank and all my board members sat down and convinced me we should move away from providing this as a tool to consumers and try to make it be available to corporations. And we struggled and we burned the money and we changed direction and it never went with the original idea. Entopia had MetaSearch four years before it even became the idea. And we had lots of interests. Who were the people who were interested? CIA, MI5, Department of Defense of France. Everybody wanted to use our product, not for what we had meant it to be, but for a spook business. And I basically said we have to close down this one because our idea was to make the lives of people richer, not to get the big brother to come and control everyone. So timing is very important. The other important part of the six-dimensional matrix, the third axis, is the geographical innovation value. Innovation does not move at the same pace in different parts of the world. Everywhere, you have to figure out what time, in what geography, what makes sense. One way we can look at innovation related to geographic is it used to be everybody had to come to Silicon Valley to start multi-billion dollars, big successful companies. Diaspora came to Silicon Valley and created some amazing companies. However, in the last 10 years or so, diaspora of Silicon Valley culture, the people who have seen what has worked in Silicon Valley, the culture of innovation, have started to move it into many other parts of the world. And you have seen these incubators, whether they're local, physical, or virtual, popping up all over of the world. When we started to set up computer labs as part of our charity philanthropy projects, in 36 countries, our idea was we bring 21st century education to schools all over the world. We allow people to interact, help them develop innovation entrepreneurship. Out of that, new ideas come, and hopefully VCs would come to different parts of the world and invest and create lots of jobs. This was what was driving a lot of our foundation's work. Well, 
the trend was so powerful, this happened. And it would have happened with or without us. I don't want to say that, hey, we caused it. We helped a little bit to make this happen. But many, many parts of the world in the last 10 years have set up these local or virtual incubators or accelerators all over the world. And I made this about six months ago. I bet you the number of flags are a lot more. And as I have traveled in many different parts of the world, whether as part of the United Nations or for our foundation or our venture capital fund, I have seen this every country, everywhere. Many, many of these keep spreading and showing up. Now, the fourth dimension so what is, is the, something uh, that probably is not really URL. discussed in many of the entrepreneurial conferences. The stage. What's the URL for the live it is page? the nanotech innovation value. If you look at what is visible to the eye, it's more than 100 Where? microns. Anything bigger than 100 microns we can see. In the 60s, 70s, and then later on 80s was driven by microelectronics revolution that when we figured out how to go be, be below 10 microns to 5 microns to 2 microns to 1 micron geometries for integrated circuits and that has continued so right now we are at the nanotech level anywhere between 0 to 20 nanometers is state of the art and some of the labs in advanced places are actually looking at sub-nanometer at the level of 100 picometer or above on the next wave of semiconductor processing technology. The current state of the art is somewhere between 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 10, depending on what field and where you look at. And you might say, why is it that this has such an amazing impact? Nanotech allows physical, electrical, and optical properties of the matter to be changed. And this is done most of the places through wet chemistry. Wet chemistry depends on the space that you apply the chemicals to. If you are operating at the level of a cube with one centimeter dimension, the total area is six square centimeters. But if you go and operate at the level of one nanometer, you have 6,000 square meters to apply your wet chemical too. And therefore, sky is the limit. You could practically change all the properties of a matter. And that's where it gets exciting. So is our next speaker ready? The fifth element on the axis, again at 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 10, within this area, is molecular biology. And we all saw when Dolly was cloned, we were saying, where is this going through? And now we literally are seeing the creation of superhumans. Here is a prediction I will give you. Anybody in this room who is below age 30 has a chance to live 150 years of high quality life or more. So those of you below age 30, you really have a chance. Not a miserable life that you can't hear, you can't see, your knees are hurting, but a high quality life, up to 150 years. That's how fast molecular biology is moving and the amazing achievements on a daily basis going on there. So those all have been the positive side of innovation. There is a dark side to innovation. We have all heard about weapons of mass destruction, whether they're nuclear, chemical, or cyber attacks, how much misery they could create. With 
the recent developments, the Big Brother, even in the United States, has become an issue. In many other countries, we believed from beginning that Big Brother was there in America. We thought we don't have it, but it figures out it's actually there and quite strong. And rise of the de demonic robots. We have seen all the Terminator movies and we know what robots could do. It's not science fiction anymore. With the drones and with the additional intelligence powered by cloud computing, the rise of demonic robots is within our reach, absolutely as we speak. And then we can look into biological side for mutant monsters, biological germs, how we could destroy the whole world very quickly, or what already has happened in 2008, applying the highest level of information technology for high frequency trading and creating high stakes gambling that we had financial meltdown in Wall Street that nobody could stop it. In one day, NASDAQ, uh, I mean, uh, S&P dropped over uh, got 700 points, if I remember correctly. And the whole thing in here was within financial investors that high rate of return justifies so everything. Uh, that is Lowers. the basics is of capitalism 1.0. So we'll the job and, of the uh, CEO of a company okay. is defined Probably as two minutes and come on maximize the profit. I disagree uh, with that. And I believe we need to have the sixth dimension, which is global human values driven by SPI, the Social Progress Index. If we look at the ranking of SPI in the world, US, United States is number one in GDP, but number six, number six in SPI ranking. Do you know which country is number one? Sweden based on level of education, healthcare, opportunities available for people to grow, and the surveys that says one of the nicer places to live. So what's the difference between capitalism 1.0 versus capitalism 2.0? Speculation capitalism is 1.0 and it's all driven by IRR that says we do everything that only benefits shareholders. Innovation capitalism says we want to produce very high IRR, but at the same time we want to take care of our employees, our customers, society and environment. So it's driven by SPI. When you say this, many people say, oh, you cannot make a lot of money. Well. Look at a company like Google. Very happy employees, lots of happy customers, very happy shareholders because it has such a high valuation. But the company pushes employees to take 20% of their time and go and do something good that benefits society, benefits the environment. Look at Apple, look at Facebook. When Apple went public, it wasn't just one or two people who became millionaires, over a hundred people became millionaires. All the employees benefited. When Facebook went public, over a thousand people became millionaires. So innovation capitalism benefits everyone, not just one or two guys like capitalism 1.0 does. I guess it's not moving anymore. The last chart, is it, I cannot is it, show you. Is it, is, it, is it working? No, it's not. The last chart is not coming. Last slide. Can you guys go to the next slide? Well, why don't you, uh, while they're working on it, well, you can finish up. <laughs> so the last slide that hopefully we, it will come along is what are the characteristics of innovation economy? It is based on take care of everyone, 
It's based on participative management. It's not a boss is dictator and tells everyone what to do. People go and create a company, not just to make money, but they want to produce something that benefits society and gets them to be proud. We have a high level of acceptance of failure. And when the company is successful, everybody benefits. Even when the company fails, society wins because during the period that the company was in existence, it was creating jobs for many people. I guess we skipped that last slide. I didn't want to show this slide. This is the new fund that we are creating. That This was the last slide I wanted to show you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank Ra you so much. Round of applause for Carmen. Thank you very much. Great stories and experiences.